Hi everyone, this is the Utah State University Statesman. My name is Taylor Kreif. I am here with Greg Jordan. He is the American Independent Candidate running for governor here in Utah. And we're just gonna be asking him a few questions, some of them that you guys have submitted, uh, some that you would like to know about, or personal questions about Greg, and we'll just get to know him. So thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Of course. All right, so my first question, that I have for you. Uh, what motivated your decision to run for office? Well, I am the father of 18 children. After three marriages, I buried two wives. And I have 73 grandchildren and five great grands. So my main motivation is to make Utah a better place for my grandchildren and great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And then COVID hit mm -hmm. and the unconstitutional nature of the COVID response has added more vim and vigor to my campaign. I want to correct the unconstitutional actions of Governor Herbert and Spencer Cox, who I tag as COVID Cox uh, because the Constitution doesn't allow for emergencies or exceptions. We have the right, the First Amendment right, for peaceful assembly in any size groups. We have the right of freedom of worship at any time. And the closing of the churches, the closing of the businesses, which is actually a violation of the Fifth Amendment and the U.S. of the U.S. Constitution and the Utah State Constitution, Article One, Section One, provides both religious liberty and freedom of assembly, and so it's important that they uphold their oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of both the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution. So that's why I'm running. Uh, well, so a follow-up to that, one thing that I, I've heard from people and people might respond to that saying, um, they, we, we have a constitution and they're, they're supposed to follow that, but we have a, a time where a lot is unknown and people are scared and we have a, a virus that we don't know. We don't know, we don't know how to contain it. We don't know what to do with it. So in that instance, wouldn't exercising some of those powers be prudent? Well, as I said, there's no exception in the First Amendment. You can, you have that right unconditionally, and it's not given to us by the government. These are God-given rights. So unless God takes them away, man can't limit them. And constitutional solutions is what our campaign is about. It's not easy to find a constitutional solution, mm -hmm. but if we had geared up testing first and then isolated the individuals who were um, ill or test positive for two weeks, we wouldn't have had to isolate. Oh, did I lose you? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you still there? I'm here. Okay, uh, we wouldn't have to have shut down so many things like the churches, like the businesses. That's bullying tactics where you isolate individuals and the, the un, uh, uninfected, the healthy people, and cause them economic and loss of their business, loss of their livelihoods. Uh, churches are an essential service. They should have kept churches open. Mm -hmm. But do the social distancing as individual responsibility, not a government mandate. That's, that is draconian. That is tyrannical. That's not the American way. We're following the Chinese Communist Party plan for, for dealing with this. I'm sorry, we're not the Chinese communists here in Utah. We are independent Americans, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and another question that 
someone gave me, which goes right along with that. And you sort of already answered this, but how do you think uh, the COVID response has been overall? And I know you just answered that, but you can elaborate if you want. And what do you think that they should do going forward in the future? What would you like to see in the future? Well, I would like to see, uh, I live in Utah County. So we've just gone from the yellow phase to back to the orange phase and have a, a countywide mask mandate. And the, the whole concept of government doing things, quote, for our good, unquote, is a false narrative. Government is supposed to protect our rights and our liberties, not restrict our rights and our liberties. Government is supposed to, if it was a proper government, is supposed to find the solution that would enable everyone to still function in their business, still function in their daily lives, but not shut them down. And um, I've, I've mentioned that we need to, to isolate the people uh, who are ill, you can quarantine them for two weeks or put them in hospitals, but you can't quarantine healthy people. That's not medically indicated. That's not good public health policy. That is wrong. It's unconstitutional. And the, the problem is it's an easy fix to tell the people they are individually responsible for their own lives. Um, that is a matter of pure choice. Everyone wants to be pro-choice for schools, for abortion, for you know all of these different things. But when it comes to your individual life, we need our own choice. And that's what the Constitution provides us. Um, if you want to be pro-choice, you need to be pro-choice about everything. If you want to be pro-life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you need to be pro-life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness about everything. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, next question that was submitted. Uh, if you're elected, what would you do to combat climate change? To combat which? To combat climate change. Um, well, one of the few golden or silver linings to the COVID response when they shut everything down, we cleared out the brown cloud over Salt Lake City and the Wasatch Front mm -hmm. by the lack of transportation going on. Um, when there was a third of the cars on I-15, it was amazing. You could get around and the brown cloud was gone. Um, another one of the silver linings was parents found out how hard it was to educate their children being at home with the schools shut down. Um, so maybe they appreciate teachers just a little bit more. Uh, but climate change is something that is important because it affects everyone's health. Bad air affects people mostly who have asthma and breathing issues, COPD, those kind of things. Um, we're doing, we're taking baby steps on the clean air issue. Unfortunately, when man gets involved trying to fix, quote, nature, unquote, we muck it up, something fierce. Um, look at the forest fires and things going on on the West Coast. Um, that's affecting our air here. When man tries to fix nature, it's not a good thing. Nature does things on larger cycles and bigger um, roller coaster rides, ups and downs. Than, than we can fathom a lot of the times. And climate is an important thing, but 
that's a long-term process. We can't fix it in the next four or 10 or 20 years. We can take good steps. And we've done that with wind farms, with alternate energy, with electric cars, with cleaner fuels. But those are just baby steps. And we just need to continue those baby steps. Wonderful. And uh, sort of a, a tag on to that, about 75% of Utah is public lands, as I, I'm sure you know. So what would you do as governor to address public land usage? Well, public lands are supposed to be open to the public. Uh, a lot of the lands they're trying to, to make into wilderness lands or areas where you only see one human every 24 hours. Uh, that's not the public. That's the, the elite, the people who can afford hiking and camping equipment and can afford to be off work for um, a week to go out into the wilderness. Um, they want to make an area of of Timpanogos Mountain um, wilderness, and it's within a couple of miles of the Wasatch Front, of Pleasant Grove, of a lot of people that go up um, Grove Canyon and Battle Canyon to to enjoy the the wildflowers and stuff on the area of Timpanogos. Putting wilderness area within a mile or two of a populated area is um, it's as dumb as a brick. I'm sorry. Uh, you need more of a buffer between a wilderness area and populated areas. Uh, making the West Desert a wilderness area that nobody wants to visit anyway because there's nothing out there except a lot of loneliness um, that makes more sense because it's miles and miles away of populated areas mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a difficult thing but it, you have to use your common sense um, the the environment and the, the, the outside are meant to be used by the public. And if the environmentalists don't like roads being put into the public lands, um, I'm sorry, but that's how public gets access to the lands is through roads. Um, if they don't like logging going on, well, we saw with Yellowstone and we're seeing on the West Coast that the proper management of forests is actually, you take out the dead wood and the underbrush and you don't have a, a problem with forest fires. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the idea is using what God gave you between your ears, your common sense to live with the the public lands and be good stewards of the land uh, unfortunately in utah we have a part of our state constitution that says we give up all unappropriated lands to the federal government mm. uh, that would require a constitutional amendment to change that and i would love to change that and then tell not ask but tell the federal government this is our land get the heck off. This is our land. We can manage. We can deal with it better than you can 3,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this next question, a lot of people actually were curious about this. So this summer um, has been a, a very contentious summer in terms of uh, police brutality and police reform after the killing of George Floyd and all the protests. So there are a few people that were, were very anxious about this question, what would you do as governor to, uh, to deal with police brutality and uh, racial justice police reform 
I know that's a very heavy question, but just all of all those things that we're dealing with right now. Yes. Um, the social justice issues are contentious right now. Mm -hmm. But as I said previously, common sense has to enter into this. Um, this weekend, there was a lot of uh, rioting and, and demonstrations about uh, Brianna Taylor, who was killed by police officers. And only one officer was indicted for something really unassociated with the death of Brianna, shooting into other apartments. Um, that was unfortunate. But the best way to change the system first is to vote. You get out and vote and put people in the offices that have your views or that will be listening to you, not be the arrogant, well, I'm in for four more years and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, like Tanner Range said down in Utah County, uh, they said, we're going to impeach you. And he said, good luck with that. Because he knows we don't have a recall by petition in the state of Utah, which I would like to see, actually. But um, if if people get involved in the system, primarily, we need... Oh, might have lost you. Let's see. Cannot hear you anymore. <laughs> Justice question. You had a wonderful answer. Wanted to, to let you keep going with that. Okay, what was I know we were talking about? Uh, we were talking Brianna Taylor, and you said that there needs to be a recall. Uh, that's what you would hope, and then I oh, after that. yeah, I I mentioned Tanner Range mm -hmm. saying he was uh, good luck with trying to impeach him because we don't have a recall by petition. But what we need in, in Utah is more civilian review commissions of the police department. Right now, we only have two. Um, West Valley and Salt Lake City are the only two communities. Mm -hmm. We need one in every community, in Logan, in Provo, in St. George, in the little towns even, because the review commission the civilians get involved and review the incidents, review the policies of the police department. More minds make for better policy. Uh, we also need judicial review committees to oversee what the judges are doing and see if they're sentencing too harshly or sentencing too leniently, if people are getting off for um, nonviolent crimes like um, drug dealing, like uh, tickets uh, for underage drinking or for driving or whatever, those are reviewable by the Civilian Review Commission. Mm -hmm. We need more citizen involvement to make better policy in the state of Utah. Wonderful. Uh Another question I have here, how would you, as, uh, I mean, as you know, we have quite a few universities here in Utah. We have a very large uh, college population. How would you as governor represent uh, college students? Well, I would like to see more JCs, more junior colleges in the state. Right now, we only have Snow College down in Ephraim as our, as a junior college. Um, a couple of them, like, it used to be called Trade Tech in Provo, and then it became Utah Community College, and then it became UVU, Utah Valley University, which is actually the largest state-run university in the state right now. Um, I think there's like, I don't know, if you count all of the part-time students, there may be as many as 50 or 60,000 students attending UVU mm -hmm. at one time or another. Um, but we need more junior colleges. I'd like to see one up in Tremont, um, maybe 
following the the trade tech kind of uh, model, using it as uh, a trade school as well as uh, a junior college. Um, I'd like to see one in Parowan or changing the uh, CEU campus in Blanding to a full junior college uh, of its own. There's there's a lot of opportunities. We have a Utah State University Extension um, campus out in the Uinta Basin, and um, that needs to be its own junior college. If we expand junior colleges, that will expand the possibility of more college students in our state and getting, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of only doing STEM uh, mm -hmm. in secondary schools. It needs to be STEAM, add arts, that's music, art, and that kind of education to make a well-rounded individual coming out of our schools not just um, on the college track. We need more trade people. We need more carpenters. We need more heating and air conditioning. I have a son who's uh, graduated from an apprentice system with heating and air conditioning. He's making $60,000 a year in heating and air conditioning. That's a good wage by anybody's standards. So, um, and as governor, we make a recommendation to the legislature that sets what now it's called the Higher Education School Board, or um, it used to be called the Board of Regents, that sets what the tuition is for college students. I would love to see college tuition in the state of Utah at $5,000 a semester, that would make it affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, SUU in Cedar City is close to that. They're just over $5,000 a semester. There's no reason UVU, the U of U and Utah State can't be at $5,000 a semester if they really wanted to, if they tried. And that's one of my goals as governor is to do that. Right now, we're third in the nation in the lowest tuition uh, for college students. And I'd like to see us at the lowest tuition in the state, in the nation. So, yeah. so I think a lot of college students can probably get on board with that. I think they would, I think they would approve. <laughs> uh, Another question we had, what, uh, this is kind of a fun one, what uh, books or podcasts or uh, music are you, are you listening to right now that you would even recommend to other people? Well, actually, I'm writing a podcast. Oh. Uh, I work with a group who is called Storyteller Productions, and we've, my, the boss, the director of, of Storyteller, has spent 22 years searching for Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and Etta Place, uh, what they did after they left South America. The 1969 movie, 68, 69 movie starring Robert Redford, Paul Newman, and um, Catherine Ross kind of left the impression that they were killed in South America. The Butch and Sundance were killed. But actually, we found out that um, Sundance Kid came back to Utah. He had a family in Loa, Utah. He fathered two daughters by a widow woman who already had six kids. So he had a tremendous responsibility that he undertook. And that in 19, uh, 30, 31 or 32, he went fishing to Fish Lake uh, down by Richfield mm -hmm. and came home with uh, gold coins that he spread all over the kitchen table. And then they used that to buy a ranch in Duchesne, uh, up by Duchesne, and he paid cash in the 1930s for 
his ranch that he stayed at the rest of his life, and he died in like 1935 or 36 when uh, he was helping an individual who was a deputy sheriff in Carbon County named Matt Warner, who was also a member of the Wild Bunch. Uh, Matt wrote a book about his outlaw days, and uh, the guy who was formerly known as the Sundance Kid or Harry Alonzo Longabout was his birth name. But in Duchesne, he was known as William Long, and he's buried in the Duchesne City Cemetery under that name, under that headstone. But he died when Matt Warner, we believe, uh, shot him with a 22 while he was sitting on a horse. Mm -hmm. And the family, knowing he'd been an outlaw before but didn't know who he was, uh, told the sheriff, well, it must have been a suicide, so we'll close the case real fast. And uh, But we have found the Sundance Kid buried in Utah, Butch Cassidy came back to the United States, married a, a woman, lived in Spokane, Washington under the name of William Thaddeus Phillips. And when an old girlfriend from his outlaw days sent him a love letter, his wife kicked him out of the house and he went back home to Circleville and died on the back porch of his uh, youngest sister um, and in Circleville and was buried there up in the mountains near a place called um, Tom's Cabin. And in 1969, his body was moved from there. And we believe he's buried where his mother's grave is in Circleville. And then at a place who was known as Mrs. Sundance is from the Uinta Basin, the Browns Park area. Uh, her birth name was uh, Ann Bassett, and the Bassett Ranch is very well known and in, in uh, outside of Vernal and in the Utah Colorado border area. But she came back to the United States from South America, where all three of them was were living for a time, and uh, she married a, a prospector and rancher, and died in Leeds. Her body was cremated and eventually was her ashes were scattered over Brown's Park, her favorite place in the world. So all three, Butch, Sundance, and Etta, are buried here in Utah. I've written a, a podcast. I haven't got it produced yet, uh, but there's a lot of good information about Butch, Sundance, and Etta out there. So, And I've been looking at the the cold podcast uh on ksl and um there's there's a lot of good stuff out there mm -hmm. what inspired you to to start this podcast i'm curious well i was i was working with uh with this group uh i've been filming uh interviews of of people we interviewed Butch's great grand nephew um, down in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he was telling us things like Butch was sending letters to, to Lola, uh, well, to his, to his youngest sister and his father, who had, uh, his mother had died while he was being an outlaw. And that was one of Butch's great regrets. But he kept up. Uh, he visited them in 1925. And so they knew he was alive and well and doing well. He, he actually had a manufacturing business in Spokane called Phillips Manufacturing. And we have DNA linking uh, William Thaddeus Phillips and Butch Cassidy off of a manuscript that he wrote after the 1929 crash that took away, it essentially shut down his manufacturing business. And uh, so he wrote this 200 page manuscript called The Bandit Invincible. And Brent Ashworth is a document collector, one of the 
one of the largest document collectors in the world. Um, he has the original copy and we took DNA off of that and compared it with letters that Butch Cassidy had written to the boys at the Concordia tin mine in South America where he, he had worked and uh, they matched. So we have conclusive evidence that Butch and William Thaddeus Phillips are the same individual. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. That sounds really interesting. Uh, last question that I have, another fun one here. Uh, someone wanted to know, Utah is famous for its uh, soda shops. What is your go-to drink? Oh, my particular poison of choice <laughs> is Cherry Dr. Pepper. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Love it. Perfect. Well, Everyone, thanks again for tuning in. My name is Taylor Cripe. Uh, this has been the Utah State University Statesman. I'd like to once again thank, uh, thank Gregory uh, Duerden for joining us. Thanks, you.